Okay, thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? All right, um, what I'm going to try to do in the time we have before lunch is um, give an overview of seismic anisotropy and why it's an important um, observable if we care about mantle deformation, which we all do very deeply. Um, I haven't been keeping exact track, but I, I know that um, at least a half a dozen of the speakers who have talked over the last um, two weeks have mentioned anisotropy in one way or another. So Greg talked about it in the context of rheology, and, and Meredith touched on it in the context of continental structures. Um, and I was quite excited that yesterday, when we had the, um, the brief presentations by the student groups um, talking about potential projects, I think at least three of the groups mentioned seismic anisotropy as a potential observable that they could use to test the models they want to think about. So I, I think and hope that the seed has already been, been planted, that um, seismic anisotropy is a very useful observable um, to get at if you want to look at, at deformation processes in the mantle. Um, so to kind of begin at the beginning, you know, what is seismic anisotropy? What do we mean when we use the term? So this refers to the situation in which the speed at which a seismic wave propagates depends on its direction. So basically, we have V1 in this direction, V2 in this direction, and they're not equal. So this could be um, a, a propagation direction of a seismic wave, or it could be a polarization direction. And I've accompanied this simple little diagram with a, just a photograph of a single crystal of olivine. Um, olivine is, of course, the primary constituent of the upper mantle, and it also has um, a pretty strong intrinsic anisotropy. So a single crystal of olivine has a shear wave anisotropy um, of about 18%. So when we're thinking about uh, anisotropy in the mantle, we're mainly thinking about it in, in terms of, of um, olivine. So um, I promise I'm not going to show equations for an hour and a half, but I did just want to take us back to um, the talk that Yaron gave last week um, when he showed this um, sort of isotropic version of the seismic wave equation and made the point that if you have an isotropic solid, you only need two independent um, constants, two independent elastic moduli to, um, to describe wave speed propagation. Um, or wave, wave speeds, and, and you have these two wave types, um, P and S. Um, so the, the situation is you know, fairly simple for an isotropic solid, and of course the Earth is um, not isotropic. The situation gets a great deal more complicated when we start thinking about anisotropy. So this is the um, anisotropic form, or the general form of Hooke's law, where we're relating the strain tensor and the, um, sorry, the strain tensor and the stress tensor um, with this you know, fourth rank um, elastic tensor, which has 81 uh, entries in it, and you can use a bunch of symmetry arguments to um, reduce that to 21 independent elastic constants. Um, so if your eyes are glazing over a little bit at the, this you know, fourth rank elasticity tensor, um, then I've accomplished my goal in showing you this slide, which is just to make the point that um, wave propagation in anisotropic media really can be very complicated. It can be very tricky. Um, so here's the upshot that's important for the purposes of this talk. Um, so when you have anisotropy, now our wave speeds are going to vary with direction. And instead of uh, two types of waves, P and S waves, we actually now have three possible um, polarizations. So these are known as the quasi-P and then two um, quasi-S waves. So this is kind of the, the basis for un understanding shear wave splitting. Um, so don't get me wrong, I mean, we, you know, seismologists do um, an awful lot of seismology. Um, you know, you can do an awful lot with the isotropic form of the wave equation, and we can make some various simpl simplifications to make this um, horrible elasticity tensor a little bit less daunting. 
Um, but the point remains that wave propagation in anisotropic media really can get quite complicated quite fast. Um, okay, so where in the Earth do we have anisotropy? Um, this is a cartoon from a, um, a review paper that I wrote with Torsten Becker a couple of years ago on um, seismic anisotropy and mantle dynamics. And actually, if you're looking for, this is an, an EPSL Frontiers paper, so it's not, it's not huge. So if you're looking for kind of a, a manageable um, overview paper on anisotropy, um, you might want to take a look at this one. Um, so this is you know, a pretty uh, complicated cartoon showing where, where in the Earth we, um, we think we have anisotropy based on, on seismic measurements. Um, you know, this figure was made by two mantle geophysicists, so we actually don't have the crust on here. We can have um, quite, strong, <laughs> quite strong anisotropy locally in the crust. Um, for someone like me who sort of lives in the mantle, this is just um, noise on top of the signal um, in the mantle. But I, I don't want to, um, you know, certainly crustal anisotropy is extremely important and can tell us a lot about crustal processes. Um, what's being shown here, so this line here, this is um, radial anisotropy from um, the Kostowski et al. model. And I'm going to define the term radial anisotropy in just a second. Um, but this is basically the um, difference between horizontally and vertically polarized waves. You can see that the strength of anisotropy in the mantle sort of um, you know, peaks at a depth of maybe you know, 100 to 200 um, kilometers and then decreases. And, and um, it looks actually as though most of the lower mantle um, looks isotropic. Um, we do have strong anisotropy down here at the base of the mantle in the D double prime layer. This um, has been known for quite some time, and understanding why that is is a really interesting problem. Um, down here, this actually represents the radial anisotropy in the inner core. Um, the inner core has actually extremely st strong anisotropy. You know, not the focus of the, the talk today, um, but certainly very interesting and important nonetheless. Um, what I'm Yes, that's right. That's right. Absolutely. Yes, yes. There are, and I mean, certainly there are, you know, uncertainties and there are many different models for, for the inner core. Um, what I'm really going to focus on in the talk today is kind of this part of the diagram where we have, you know, slabs going down here. We have an ocean basin. We perhaps have upwellings. We have a, um, a continental lithosphere over here that might have uh, frozen anisotropy as well as active um, asthenospheric flow. And I'm going to talk through, you know, how we know some of the things that are encapsulated in this um, cartoon um, and how we can use them to talk about or to infer um, things about mantle processes. Um, so just to quickly de define some useful terms, actually a lot of these have come up in the talks already, um, but just so we're all on the same page about what we're talking about. So radial anisotropy, as I briefly said, this refers to a dif the difference in propagation speed um, between horizontally polarized waves versus vertically polarized waves. So this is um, SH versus SV, or if you're thinking about surface waves, this is you know, love wave propagation um, versus Rayleigh wave propagation. Um, as a methyl anisotropy, when we use this term, we're referring to the directional dependence of wave speed um, with, with azimuth. So this is now in the horizontal plane. And I, I want to emphasize that these, you know, these two aren't mutually exclusive. You, know, you can have both types of anisotropy, and we do have both types of anisotropy. Um, but it's basically just a couple of different geometries, and it's you know, really oftentimes um, a simplification that we make based on the geometry of our, our experiment. Um, one other term that gets used a lot is transverse isotropy. And this, this term and I initially found very confusing because it has the word isotropy in it, but it really is describing a, a, a type of um, anisotropic geometry. So this is equivalent to hexagonal anisotropy where you basically have you know, one symmetry axis, either fast or slow, in one direction. And then in the, the plane perpendicular to that, you don't have any wave speed um, variations. So this is a, often used to, as a simplified description of, of um, mantle anisotropy. And here, instead of 21 independent elastic constants, now you have only five. So the situation is not um, quite so dire. But very often, you know, this is kind of used um, you know, often by seismologists as a, a simplified description of anisotropy in the mantle. OK, so why is the upper mantle anisotropic? So we've already said that you know, the upper mantle is made of a bunch of minerals, but um, the, the most volumetrically important one is olivine. Um, but as Greg alluded to in, in his talk earlier in the week, there's more to the story than that. And um, the idea is that when you have a collection of mineral crystals, so you have a mantle rock, and it undergoes um, deformation, at least under certain conditions. And Greg has already talked about how you can have 
uh, deformation accommodated either in the dislocation creep regime, which is going to give you lattice preferred orientation, or in the diffusion creep regime, um, which won't. So if you take this rock and deform it um, via dislocation creep, individual crystals will tend to align, preferentially align in certain directions. And this is known as lattice preferred orientation, LPO. And as Greg said, sometimes CPO is used kind of interchangeably um, to describe this. And this is going to result in seismic anisotropy that is relevant on the, you know, on the length scale, um, the, the length scale of, of seismic waves. So this gives you seismic anisotropy that can be felt by seismic waves. And this cartoon just kind of sums this up. So here we have a rock, a mantle rock that's been strained, and you can see that these grains um, have a statistical preferred orientation where most of them are pointing down or near that. And this is something that can be um, investigated in the lab and also can be measured in, in mantle rocks. This is a set of, of pole figures for the um, fast, slow, and intermediate um, directions in, in olivine. So this is the, the famous um, type A um, olivine fabric. So this, it's really this idea that there's a relationship between deformation and the resulting anisotropy via LPO that, that makes anisotropy an interesting um, thing to study if you want to learn about the mantle. Um, so Greg has already shown a version of this um, plot in his talk earlier in the week. This is the famous alphabet soup of um, olivine fabric types. And again, as Greg said, prior to about 2000, so right around the time I was starting grad school, um, the story really was very simple because we mostly were kind of living in an A-type world. Um, and, and since then, um, a lot of experimentalists, you know, Shankarado is, um, is among them and certainly leading the, the charge on a lot of this, now we have this whole host of different olivine fabric types that us seismologists have to um, contend with. And each of these fabric types is associated with a certain set of um, deformation conditions, so water content and stress and, and temperature. And um, you know, it's certainly being uh, pretty well mapped out, at least in the laboratory, where we might expect these um, different olivine types um, to, to pop up, depending on the deformation conditions. Um, but this certainly is a, you know, presents a, a challenge to seismologists because now we have to um, you know, worry quite a bit about what type of olivine fabric we might have in the region where we're trying to interpret our seismic anisotropy measurements. Um, there is another mechanism for, for anisotropy other than LPO, and that's uh, shape preferred orientation, or SPO. Um, and this is a cartoon um, of how this might work in, in the lowermost mantle in D double prime, which is a place where we, we think there might be a contribution from, um, from uh, SPO to anisotropy. Um, and the idea is that you have, uh, say, partial melt aligned in, in tubules or in sheets. So it doesn't have to be partial melt. It can actually be any, um, any material that has a, a contrast and elastic properties. The idea is if these um, shapes are, are oriented somehow via a flow process, you're going to get an effective anisotropy, um, just as you would get, you know, for with an LPO scenario. Um, and you know, again, this cartoon is sort of specific to to D double prime at the base of the mantle, um, but certainly in in regions of the upper mantle where we might have significant amounts of partial melt, um, the uh, kind of SPO uh, type mechanism might might also be relevant. So that's another factor that we need to take into consideration. Um, so I hope that I've kind of cast this in a way that makes it clear that anisotropy can be a really uh, key tool for understanding mantle dynamics. And this is a cartoon, kind of shows the, the simplest possible uh, flow scenario, simplest possible olivine LPO um, that, that gives us um, a commonly used rule of thumb in interpreting anisotropy. Um, and the way this goes um, is, is as follows. So you might have, say, horizontal um, flow in the asthenospheric mantle. So you have velocity vectors pointing like this. And if you have a vertical gradient in your velocity, that's going to give you basically a, a simple, simple shear type strain. And you're going to tend to align if, if this is your you know, shear plane here and your shear direction is going in this um, in this, the direction of this arrow. And then if we have kind of the classical A-type olivine LPO, that's going to give us um, a fast direction of anisotropy um, that is going to more or less align with the horizontal direction of mantle flow. And this has led to um, a very commonly used rule of thumb that you can go out and measure a fast direction of anisotropy at a seismic station 
using shear wave splitting, which I'll talk about in a second, or, or other uh, mechanisms. And that's you know, more or less telling you about the direction of horizontal mantle flow beneath the station. So this is a highly simplified rule of thumb. I mean, I think most seismologists would agree it's, this is probably over. I mean, we know that this is oversimplified. And it gets quite tricky when you, you know, try to apply this very simple rule of thumb in regions of the Earth where you have you know, a much more complicated velocity, mantle velocity field, much more complicated strain distribution, and much more complicated uh, distribution of fabric types. But nevertheless, this is a, you know, the rule of thumb that seismologists often kind of start from when interpreting these measurements. So that's some of the idea of why uh, anisotropy is important. Let's talk about a few ways that we have to measure it. Um, so shear wave splitting is, is probably the most popular tool. It's very commonly applied um, to study anisotropy in the upper mantle. The principle is pretty simple. This is another cartoon from Edgar Nero. You have a shear wave that has um, you know, some initial polarization. That's the black line here. And it, it's initially you know, linearly polarized in this plane. It's going to hit an anisotropic medium. And now the wave equation tells us that we have two quasi S waves that are solving the wave equation. And so this effectively splits into a fast and slow component. And now these are traveling at different um, speeds. So if you go over here and you're a seismologist and you have a you know, way of recording this, um, we can measure. So Yaron told us last week that seismologists really only know how to measure travel time. So we, we do that. We measure the differential travel time between the fast and the slow waves. And shear wave splitting and, and analysis, um, you know, we figured out how to measure one more thing, and that's the direction of this um, fast wave polarization. So these are the, the parameters. You measure the fast polarization direction, which is telling you about the geometry of anisotropy, and then the time uh, delay, delta t, which is telling you about the strength of anisotropy and or the length of the, the path that the ray has taken through the anisotropic medium. Um, so this is a fairly simple um, Conceptually, and just to put it in the context of how we actually do this in the Earth, yes, I'm so sorry. Yes, I'm going to show it uh, an example in just a second. It's, that's a great question. Um, yes, uh, you, you might regret asking it, but, <laughs> um, but I'm going to show you. Um, so just first to situate this in kind of the context of the Earth, so I'm just turning this cartoon. Um, you know, so usually we do this with, with shear waves that are propagating almost vertically. So here's our seismic station. We're going to measure fast and slow um, waves. And in terms of the seismic phases that we actually are using, um, you know, it's very common to use SKS phases, or it's kind of a sister phase here, SKKS, which has two, um, two legs of a um, compressional wave in the liquid outer core. Then there's a P to S conversion, and then these phases both travel as shear waves um, on the receiver side through the mantle. So these phases are very convenient for shear wave splitting for kind of a couple of reasons. I mean, you're, you don't really have to worry about um, anisotropy so much on the um, on the source side, which is nice. You know it's um, somewhere in the mantle beneath your receiver. Um, and another thing is that we have this P to S conversion at the core mantle boundary. And um, that means that we basically know the polarization of the SKS phase before it's undergone any splitting. So that's quite convenient. Um, another type of phase, there are a bunch of phases that you can, you can do this for, but um, another one is direct teleseismic S. So in this case, if you have a, an S wave that goes directly from a, an earthquake to a receiver, your anisotropy can be anywhere along the path, and you might, um, you might have some anisotropy near the source, and we can actually use these waves to study um, source-side anisotropy. Or if you can kind of correctly account for any source contribution, you can use it to study um, anisotropy beneath the receiver as well. Um, oh, you know what? I took out my shear wave splitting example for time. Why don't, why, don't I, why don't I go to it anyway? Because the question came up. So um, it is not, it's not at all trivial to make these measurements. Where is it? Here it is. OK. Um, these measurements are, sorry, that's my kid, <laughs> who you've all seen running around and is not two months old anymore. Um, <laughs> So these measurements are, I've sort of um, you know, given you the, the version of this in which, oh, it's very straightforward. You just measure polarization and delay time and, and easy peasy. 
in, in reality, from a practical point of view, these, these measurements are actually quite, can be quite tricky to make. The reason for that is because the delay times involved are, are much smaller than the period of the wave. Um, so that makes it tricky. But this is an example of um, really a, a quite good and well-constrained shear wave splitting measurement. What I'm showing here, so up here in this corner, these are the radial and transverse components of the, um, both the horizontal components of the seismogram. So the dashed um, blue line is the radial component. The solid red line is the transverse component. So if you had no splitting and you had just an, an SKS arrival that had been unaffected by anisotropy, we would expect all the energy to be on the radial component because you've had this P to SV conversion at the core mantle boundary. And that is you know, definitely not the case for this particular arrival. This is a wave that has been split quite significantly. Um, so instead, we have all this energy on the transverse component. And the way we actually do these measurements is you sort of, um, you sort of do a grid search over all possible delay times and fast polarizations. And you can do a couple of things. You can, you can try to find the, the pair of splitting parameters that does the best job of removing that transverse component energy. Or you can, can find the pair of splitting parameters that does the best job of um, making your fast and slow waves um, a similar shape. Um, but but it's, you know, it's not, um, because these waves, the time delays are not, you know, much bigger than the, than the period of the wave, these don't show up as two nice, beautiful, separate arrivals on a seismogram. And this particular example that I'm showing is a, a very nice, you know, straightforward example where you have about two seconds of splitting on an SKS phase, which is quite a lot. Um, but, but this, you know, we don't usually get shear wave splitting measurements that look this um, nice and well behaved. And making these measurements in the presence of, of noise and when you have complicated um, anisotropic structure can actually be quite tricky. So I think the the bottom line is we, you know, we have a, a ways to, to do it, but I mean, people still write papers and think a lot about sort of the best way to make these measurements in, um, for complicated, you know, noisy um, real data. So does that answer the, answer the question? Yep. Okay. I'm going to see Patrick again, <laughs> sorry. All right, so that's shear wave splitting. So we do this, and this is how you often will see shear wave splitting measurements um, kind of represented on a map. So this is a map of um, a compilation of shear wave splitting measurements for the Pacific Northwest. Um, so some of these are, are my measurements, but this is a compilation that comes from a lot of different people. Richard Allen's group did some of these measurements. Um, and what's being shown here is that each, um, for at each station, we're showing an, an average um, fast direction and delay time that has come from taking um, some kind of average of all the measurements that you made at that station. And it's represented as a little, a little stick. And the orientation of the bar is telling you the fast splitting direction. And the length of the bar is telling you about the delay time. And on this particular map, actually, the background color is, is kind of a smoothed and contoured version of the delay time. So the colors are also telling you about uh, the delay time or strength of anisotropy. So some assumptions go into this. Um, here, I'll, I'll stop. Yes. Yes, that's a great question. The answer is not really, <laughs> no. So, um, you know, these, are, these measurements are oops, being made on, um, as I said, SKS phases. So um, we, you know, in theory, well, in ray theory, um, the anisotropy could be anywhere between the core mantle boundary and the station. And that's a lot of mantle. Um, generally, we interpret SKS splitting as being primarily due to anisotropy in the upper mantle. For a variety of reasons, there are about five lines of evidence that suggest that is the case. And about 95% of the time, that's probably fine. Um, we do see some evidence for kind of, well, contamination of SKS, SKKS phases, sometimes by lowermost mantle anisotropy, which is great if you want to study the lowermost mantle, but a problem for upper mantle anisotropy. But a really big fundamental limitation of SKS splitting studies is that we don't have very good depth control. It's probably mostly in the upper mantle, but we have to make um, a series of, of arguments, sometimes direct, sometimes indirect, about where in the upper mantle the anisotropy is. Now, other techniques can give you better depth control, and I'm going to talk about surface waves in just a second. But with SKS, it's, it's really a, a very fundamental limitation of the method. Very good lateral resolution, very poor depth resolution. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, 
Well, for SKS and SKKS, we don't have to worry about it because um, the, we have it, this, the waves have traveled through, um, through the liquid outer core as a P wave. So this, the P to S um, conversion at the core mantle boundary is going to kind of you know, reset um, what you're going to see. So, so for these phases, you don't have to worry about what's going on on the, on the source side. For, for some, a phase like direct S, you definitely do. So Barbara, do you want to jump in? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> yes, of course. I mean, you, don't, you, know, you don't have that, uh, that resolution. But if you average the measurements on the station, you can imagine that they sample different parts in the lower most mantle. Which yes. Is the region where you have an endotropy. And so there is no, on average, these, they will sample different regions. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So Barbara's just articulated one of the lines of evidence that, you know, you can sort of take an average SKS splitting measurement and, you know, if for the case where you have good back azimuthal coverage, which, you know, we hope you do and we, we hope we do and, and in many cases you, you do, sometimes you don't, that you can kind of, um, you know, sort of average out any effects from the, the lower mantle. And I mean, also, if you, you know, if you want to study lowermost mantle anisotropy, which is a very cool thing to study, it's, it's good that we can sometimes see a signal from um, the, the lower mantle. So yes, I, I agree with that, that comment. Okay, all right, so um, I think I've said just about everything I want to say about this um, type of, of map, but this is really how, you know, how shear wave splitting measurements usually get presented. And then someone like me would, would come along and, and say, you know, here for the tectonically active Western US, um, you know, we can make the argument that we probably don't have a very thick lithosphere. We have large delay time, so this is probably mostly reflecting anisotropy in the asthenosphere. And then we can go on to sort of interpret these in terms of, of mantle processes. Yes, Gina. Uh, yes. Yes, yeah, so, so this very red area that, that Tunis pointed out, um, so this is the high lava plains in Oregon. Here we see very strong um, delay times. This color scale actually saturates, but we see delay times, um, robust delay times up to about 2.7 seconds here, very strong. Um, there may be, uh, you know, as, as always, you may have a small contribution from the crust, you know, maybe a few tenths of a second, but I think it's hard to explain the vast majority of the signal in terms of the crust. I think it represents very strong anisotropy in the asthenospheric mantle. Yes? What thickness of crust do you have to start worrying about the crustal? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I wouldn't say that there's a, you know, a really strong rule of thumb. I mean, crustal anisotropy, there, there's you know, a couple different mechanisms. So in the shallow crust, you, you probably have anisotropy due to aligned, um, aligned cracks. You know, deeper in the crust, we would expect those to close, and deeper in the crust, we're probably seeing, you know, LPO of lower crustal minerals. So one question is, you know, how coherent is that signal to give you, you know, large splitting of a shear wave that's passing through the crust? You know, I mean, certainly in places like Tibet, where you have very thick crust, um, and, and, you know, sometimes smaller shear wave splitting delay times, you, you start to get into a situation where, you know, you might have a very significant contribution from crustal anisotropy. Um, but, I, I, you know, I don't know that there's a really well-developed rule of, rule of thumb. Observationally, shear wave splitting delay times from the crust are usually on the order of a tenth of a second um, for kind of, you know, run-of-the-mill continental crust. So, yes? About the depth of the, of the anisotropy. Yes. Yes, that's right. That's right. So if there is a, you know, with, with depth, if you have a, um, a, a, a transition to, say, diffusion creep at some depth, then, then you would expect, um, you know, that the anisotropy is going to be confined to the depth regions over which you're deforming by dislocation creep. So that's absolutely true. And I, I mean, I think I would say that's not so well known where in the, you know, whether it's within the upper mantle or, or deeper, where we might see a contribution um, or the a possible transition to diffusion creep. I don't know if Greg wants to comment further on that, um, but that's absolutely the case. And I mean, that's actually why we think that there's not strong anisotropy in, in most of the upper, uh, sorry, the lower mantle, so that it probably is deforming via diffusion creep. Okay, so um, that's sure we have splitting. So we can also get very good um, constraints on anisotropy from, from surface waves. I'll first show an example um, of a 
tomography inversion that um, solves for azimuthal anisotropy, so again, variations in wave speed in the horizontal plane. This is work by Frederick Simons, and he um, did uh, surface wave tomography of Australia and added into his inversion um, parameters that describe the azimuthal anisotropy and then solved the tomography you know, simultaneously for isotropic wave speed variations. Um, and then also for anisotropy. And this is just um, a couple of depth slices through his uh, model. A major um, advantage of, of this method is that because, you know, of course, different period surface waves have different depth sensitivities, that you are able to get you know, better controls on, on the depth distribution of your anisotropy. Um, you don't have the lateral resolution that you do have, that you have with SKS, so that's you know, kind of a relative disadvantage. Um, another thing to keep in mind, and you guys have done a sort of tomography experiment as part of one of the tutorials, you know, when, you're, when you're adding you know, extra parameters into your inversion, to, um, you know, to describe anisotropy, of course, you're, you know, you're trying to solve for more parameters using the same data set, and there are trade-offs between isotropic and anisotropic structure that you know, tomographers need to, to think about and deal with. Um, another thing that's important to note is that you need very good azimuthal coverage in your data to be able to, to do this, and um, Australia happens to be a place where you have that, that good coverage. Um, but surface waves can do a very good job of giving us some depth constraints, which is, um, which is nice. Um, yeah, you could. I mean, at, you know, as with the isotropic part of the model, you have to sort of deal with the fact that you know your rays are all sampling some regions that are outside of your model, and so that is, you know, as with any tomographic inversion, that's definitely something to to think about. And so, um, you know, knowing what the contamination is from the oceanic part is is certainly important. So, yes, Bob. Um, it is worth noting that, yep, so there are, there are more panels on this, on this figure in the paper that I just didn't show on this, this slide. Um, but yeah, that's right, so these are two, um, two depth slices, you know, through the lithospheric mantle beneath Australia, and then there's, um, it's, it's actually kind of cool, the, the deeper sections, which I'm not showing here, where you're kind of getting into asthenospheric depths, um, the, this, the scatter that you see in these, um, these fast directions actually sort of um, converge to, to um, generally north-south directions, which are, are um, parallel, more or less parallel to absolute plate motion. It's kind of a neat aspect of this model. Yes? Yes, so the question is, can you invert for dipping anisotropy? So um, this model and most uh, tomography you know, schemes that do this make the assumption that, you know, you're only looking at um, variations in the horizontal plane. You know, um, I'll show in a, a minute an example of a surface wave tomography um, scheme where they're solving for radial, the radial part of the anisotropy. Um, we would love to be able to get at the dip of the symmetry axis and not make the assumption that it's, it's horizontal. Um, depending on your data coverage and the type of data that you're looking at, you know, we, we can get, um, get at that. I, I think it's tough to do with this type of data. I mean, these are surface waves that are propagating horizontally. Um, but but it, might not be, it might not be impossible. Yes? As you said, there is a very significant trade-off between the anisotropy and the heterogeneity. Yes, uh, yes. In, in the and here, I notice actually the, those anisotropy, in my opinion, Yeah, okay, so the, the question is about the sort of the scales of heterogeneity here and, and um, in particular how to evaluate that in, the light, in light of the um, strong trade-off with isotropic structure. So, I mean, I, I think, you know, certainly the authors of this paper and the folks that do these kinds of tomography inversions, you know, think very carefully about the trade-offs between isotropic and anisotropic structure and think about the length scales over which they can resolve these variations in, in heterogeneity. Um, in, in structure, this heterogeneity in, in structure. I mean, I think the, ar the authors of this paper would argue that these variations are, are real and that they are, in fact, resolving, um, you know, variations in a, a heterogeneous lithosphere over fairly short scales. But these are, you know, these are good questions to ask, certainly. For example, in the southeastern part of Australia, mm -hmm. 
right? Yep, yep. Yep, that's a, so the, I don't have a, a map on my slides here, but yeah, I mean, those, these are exactly the, the questions that you would ask with this kind of model and that the authors of this paper did ask and will, yes, yes, I mean, uh, um, yes. So, and uh, we'll, we'll look at, towards the end of the talk at some, um, some new models that have been done here at Berkeley for the North American craton, um, where there are, you know, some, there are definitely changes, there's heterogeneity in the, the anisotropic structure of the lithosphere. Um, both laterally and, and with depth that do seem to correspond with geologic um, processes. Yes, um, or provinces. It's somehow related to a unique one, but well, I would have asked how accurate uh, the exoplanet surface with the measurements, because, you know, depending on the region you're interested in, you would sample really long and different paths compared to a case, right? You sample the vertical directly. Yep, but yep. Yep, absolutely. And I mean, the, this ray path diagram, you know, sort of shows you the, the lengths of the ray paths and the, the large scales over which you're sampling the structure. So that is absolutely, you know, it's absolutely a concern and it's, you know, part of the tomography. And I mean, I think you probably got a sense for this when you were doing the tomography exercise that, you know, how you parameterize your model and how you account for, um, you know, structure off your, the path. I mean, all of this matters a lot. So um, these are all considerations that have to be taken into account. Yeah, Barbara, do you want to comment? Yes. yes. Absolutely. It's, it's very important to have good azimuthal coverage to, to really resolve this, this type of, of data. Um, okay, I'm going to just quickly show, this is um, from, from Meredith's work, this is um, an example of, of resolving radial anisotropy from surface waves. So in this case, you need to look at um, the propagation of both love waves and Rayleigh waves, which have you know, horizontal and vertical um, polarizations. Um, and I'm not going to talk too much about this model, but just to show that this is um, a slice through, through Meredith's um, model through the Pacific Ocean, and this panel down here shows the, the radial anisotropy, so this is um, basically parameterized in terms of the, the velocity in the um, horizontal direction or velocity of the horizontally polarized waves minus the velocity of the vertically polarized waves and, you know, normalized by the isotropic um, average velocity. And you can see that um, this model has very strong um, radial anisotropy, you know, particularly in the central part of the Pacific, but sort of over the, the depths, um, the depth range at which we sort of um, associate with the oceanic asthenosphere. Um, I'm going to just very quickly touch on um, anisotropic receiver function analysis. This is a very good technique for looking at sharp contrasts in anisotropic properties at depth. And um, at the very end, when we talk about continental anisotropy, I'll maybe quickly come back to this. Um, this is just a, a sort of synthetic um, uh, and I saw, or a synthetic receiver function um, experiment where you have a, a structure that has three layers and a contrast in, in isotropic wave speed at each layer. Um, and for this case, on the, our radial um, component receiver functions, we would basically expect to see a, a conversion, a P to S conversion associated with each of these boundaries. Um, and we wouldn't expect to see any variations in the radial component receiver functions with back azimuth. And we wouldn't expect to see any, um, any energy at all on the transverse components because, you know, as with the SKS phase, you have a, basically a P to SV um, conversion. So if you have flat laying, flat lying layers and no anisotropy, you basically would expect to see no um, transverse component energy. And in fact, when we go out and make these types of measurements, this is an example of a first station here in Japan. Um, here are the radial component receiver functions. The transverse component receiver functions sort of um, bend um, with, with back azimuth, so basically bend with direction. And here, there's all kinds of structure on the transverse components, um, some of which is due to, to dipping, 
uh, layers, but some of which we interpret as being due to anisotropy. So there are, you know, um, the question of how to get at depth distribution and how do you isolate the depth dependence of anisotropy has come up a lot already in the discussion. And, you know, this is another method that can help you do that because it tells you about sharp um, contrast and anisotropy at depth. Um, now, the forward modeling of these receiver functions is, is very complicated and coming up with a model that matches all these wiggles is, is non-trivial, but it's, at least it's out there as another uh, method you can use to get at depth dependence. Um, so I've said mostly what I want to say about the seismological observations. I don't have time to go into a lot of detail about um, sort of the geodynamical modeling aspect of this, um, but a very nice thing um, that we can do, and I think a very fruitful uh, area of research for those of us who care about anisotropy, is to compare the predictions of geodynamical models with observations of, of anisotropy. And you can kind of do this on a global scale. You can do it on a more regional scale. Um, these are just two examples of uh, a couple of models that are designed to study um, anisotropy in a subduction zone. These are kind of two end members. I mean, this is a, a very simple model where you have a just um, two-dimensional corner flow and a kinematically defined slab over here. You're looking at how the velocity field um, in the wedge, so you have kind of 2D corner flow here. You can trace uh, streamlines through this velocity field, and then you can um, calculate how the finite strain ellipse evolves um, along each of these, these streamlines and basically get, um, you know, get a strain field and then make some assumptions about um, olivine LPO and then make some predictions about what you would see um, in, in uh, the seismic anisotropy. So this is the sort of very simple 2D version of a geodynamical model. This is a more sophisticated, fully, dynamical, um, fully dynamic model of a subduction zone where you have um, a slab going down here and it's rolling back and you have um, sort of significant toroidal flow around the slab edge. But you can kind of do the same idea, and it, it might be a little hard to see the details, but um, up here these authors have, have calculated the evolution of the finite strain. Um, and there's actually some fairly sophisticated machinery to, um, you know, you can either make some assumptions about, you know, what, what the, uh, some simple assumptions about how the olivine LPO relates to the finite strain ellipse, but we also now have software such as DREX, which can actually, um, you know, model almost on the grain scale um, how LPO is going to evolve for very sophisticated geodynamical um, velocity models. So I don't have time to go into much more detail than that, but I did just want to make the point that a very important tool um, is to use the, you know, the predictions of geodynamical models for different processes and then compare the, the predictions that these models would make about anisotropy to um, observations that seismology, um, seismologists can make. So I hope I've convinced you that observations and, and models of seismic anisotropy do have the potential to tell us about um, dynamic processes, both past and present in the Earth's mantle. So what are the caveats? And, uh, you know, we've already mentioned a, a bunch of them. Um, I, I'm going to just, and I could, you know, talk about this for a long time, but um, I just want to highlight a couple. You know, we've already seen versions of this several times. Um, you know, it really is, um, you know, with knowing that there are a bunch of different olivine fabric types, each of which, you know, make... Um, you know, different predictions about what the elastic, you know, that big 21 um, component elastic tensor is going to look like. You know, there are many different fabric types. Um, different ones are probably going to prevail in different parts of the Earth's mantle. Um, some of, and, and all of these are going to have an effect on the overall anisotropic signature. Um, so some of the differences are, are subtle, but some are, are major. And of course, you know, B type. Uh, fabric is one of the, the major ones where it flips the, the fast direction of anisotropy by 90 degrees. So your, you know, your flow direction is 90 degrees away from what you thought it would, would be based on A-type. Um, so it's just important to, to keep in mind that olivine fabric is complicated. And if you have you know, fabric transitions and you're you're deforming rocks with a pre-existing fabric in a new fabric regime, you know, things get quite complicated quite fast. And this is a very, you know, active area of research. Um, another thing that I, I really want to emphasize is that anisotropy in the mantle, you know, really is a very complicated function of the time-integrated mantle strain along with the fabric type. And, you know, we have these rule of, rules of thumb type, um, you know, heuristics in our head about relationships between, say, fast splitting direction and mantle flow. 
And those, you know, those are great, but it is important um, to remember that they are simplifications. And this is just another example of a, a geodynamical model. Um, this is work by Karen Paskowski, who's a recent uh, PhD grad at Yale, um, looking at you know, how um, mantle flow might behave beneath the subducting slab. And you, know, you have a velocity field that, that looks like this, but really what you need to do is to look at the evolution of the finite strain field. And finite strain does not equal velocity everywhere. You know, it, for, for the very simplest flows, we can kind of um, you know, make some simplifying assumptions. But it's just important to remember that anisotropy is, in the mantle is a complicated um, time-integrated function of, of the, the strain that um, the rock has undergone. Um, you know, another thing that um, is particularly uh, tricky about interpreting shear wave splitting measurements is, um, and, and this is particularly acute in regions where you don't have the very good back azimuthal coverage that Barbara was just alluding to, um, you know, very oftentimes we, we you know, are, are limited by the data in sort of to making the assumption that you have a single horizontal layer of anisotropy beneath a seismic station. And that's, you know, I mean, we sort of know that that's not likely to be true in, in everywhere, certainly. Um, you know, luckily, we can see the signal of multiple layer anisotropy in shear wave splitting data sets. So this is um, two examples of shear wave splitting patterns. Um, these are both stations out in the western U.S., um, and they're plotted as a function of, of back azimuth. So on top, this is a, a station that doesn't show strong variations in... Um, in shear wave splitting with back azimuth, and then this is a station that's not too far away. This station is in the high lava plains. This station is in the Wallawa Mountains, um, where we do see very significant variations um, with back azimuth. And um, you know, the, the theory for sort of why, why and how we ought to see these back azimuthal variations if you have multiple layers of anisotropy um, has been worked out, and, and it's, you know, I think, we're getting to the point where oftentimes we can look at a shear wave splitting pattern and kind of diagnose complicated anisotropy. But sometimes we're limited. If you don't have very good back azimuthal coverage, and you know, that's just limited by the distribution of seismicity um, around your station, you know, sometimes this can be, can be tricky. So this is another complication when you're um, looking at shear wave splitting measurements. And a very nice way to kind of help this situation, of course, is to combine SKS um, with surface waves, because those can help to, to you know, give you control on your depth, um, depth distribution. One final thing I'll, I'll say is, well, you know, we're talking about the caveats, and we'll come back to this when we talk about continental anisotropy. Um, you know, certainly, um, particularly in continental regions where we have a you know, thick um, lithosphere, we have to think quite a lot about interpreting our measurements in terms of anisotropy in the lithosphere, which, you know, sort of by definition is stiff and rigid and probably not deforming very much right now. Um, you know, anisotropy in that region probably reflects kind of frozen in structure from past deformation processes um, versus anisotropy that's in the asthenosphere and is probably, so this is the, you know, weaker actively deforming part of the mantle. This is probably telling us about more about present day deformation processes. So teasing apart, you know, what part of your signal is in the lithosphere, what part of the, your signal is in the asthenosphere, you know, certainly in continental regions and, and in, in oceanic regions as well, you know, is a really important part of interpreting your data set and seeing whether it's telling you about past versus present deformation processes. Alicia. Um, let's see. Uh, I see, I see, yes, yes. Right, right. So um, often, certainly not always, but often in the mantle, so this is kind of referring to basically the radial anisotropy part of the signal. So oftentimes, um, horizontally polarized waves, as, as you said, travel faster than, than vertically polarized ones. That's not universal, but um, we oftentimes see it. So, so one way to explain that is that, um, if you have, you know, basically horizontal flow and your, your fast direction is um, aligning sort of horizontally, and then your, you know, slower and intermediate direction of, of olivine anisotropy are aligning in the, you know, some distributed somehow in the plane perpendicular to that, that can give you this SH greater than SV anisotropy. So it might be a, an indication that you have primarily horizontal um, flow. Um, that I 
think is the kind of the first order explanation, but you know, understanding how, the magnitude of these variations and what they mean and why we sometimes see uh, SV greater than SH is a you know, very active area of research. Greg. The keel with weak anisotropy. Oh, um, I'll come back to this a little bit towards the end when we, um, we're going to discuss, we're going to show and discuss the, the, the Berkeley model for North America. So we can come back to that. Okay. All right. So now that we've talked a little bit about the limitations, so what can we actually do with anisotropy observations? So I want to talk um, a bit about anisotropy beneath ocean basins, and then we're going to talk very briefly about subduction zones, and then we're going to talk about continents. Um, so I thought I would um, sort of show, this is a very hot off the press um, global model. This is work by Eric Debye and Yannick Ricard that I think actually is still in press at EPSL. Um, and this is their kind of latest uh, global um, model that's based on surface wave data for azimuthal anisotropy. And um, it covers both oceans and continents, but in their um, interpretation, they mostly were focusing on the ocean basins. And so what you can see here, so this is a, a depth slice at 50 kilometers, 100, 150, and then going down to um, 200. And, and this model you know, displays a lot of the same features that we were discussing we talked about the, the model for Australia in a continental region, and that the, you know, the anisotropy um, in the lithosphere is you know, much more heterogeneous and changes over very short length scales. And then you go down into the asthenosphere, and, and things are, you know, look quite a bit um, more simple. And one of the things that, that you can do with this type of model, and that these guys did, is to um, you know, test some fairly you know, simple and, and well-established you know, well established paradigms for how anisotropy in the oceanic lithosphere asthenosphere system might evolve. And so what they did is they took a, you know, a, a plate motion model and just calculated the absolute plate motion directions for these different oceanic um, plates. And then they took a seafloor age model and from that they calculated um, basically fossil spreading directions um, for different regions of the ocean floor. And then they went back to their azimuthal anisotropy model and and tested and said, okay, if we, you know, if we look at lithospheric depths and then compare our fast anisotropy directions with paleo spreading directions, how well do we do? And if we go to asthenospheric depths and then just compare our fast directions with absolute plate motions, how well do we do? And what they found is that for um, most of the faster moving plates, so I think it was the six fastest moving um, plates, so certainly you know, including the, the Pacific and then a, a bunch of others, um, they found that this paradigm actually works pretty well. So the idea that you know, the Pacific plate is, is we know it's moving very fast and you know, the, um, the prevailing wisdom is that the re reason for that is because it's, you know, it has slabs attached to it, so it's being dragged along by slab pull, um, and that it's sort of as the, the oceanic lithosphere cools, it's progressively you know, freezing in the signal from you know, past spreading episodes, basically. You know, that paradigm seems to work really very well beneath the ocean basins, at least for the faster um, moving plate. So I, I think... You know, we're going to talk next about subduction zones and, and continents, and I would say in comparison, I think we understand anisotropy beneath the ocean basins fairly well. I mean, there's still a lot of unanswered questions, and you know, particularly in the radial anisotropy signal, there's a lot to still figure out. Um, but this you know, gives us a very nice kind of paradigm for understanding lithospheric versus asthenospheric anisotropy in the ocean basins. Um, while I'm on the subject of azimuthal anisotropy beneath the oceans, I just wanted to say a, a couple of things because it came up um, quite a bit in the context of Bob Stern's talk earlier this week. You know, sort of how do we understand what are the forces driving the plates and, and can, can we have an observable that can test this? And in the discussion, we mentioned anisotropy as a way to, to test some of these ideas about plate driving forces. And um, there actually have been several recent studies that have, have done this. This example is from um, Clint Conrad and Mark Bain's work, but um, Torsen has done a lot of work on this, and have, as have others. Um, and the idea here is, is basically you know, to take a global model for azimuthal anisotropy compare it to the predictions of Mantle flow models that in, involve both kind of the, the density-driven flow as well as plate motions and also um, putting in a variable amount of net rotation of the lithosphere. So you start with plate motions from a no-net rotation frame and then add in some net rotation. 
And this actually, you know, so you can run a bunch of models varying some parameters and seeing which model gives you the best fit to these azimuthal anisotropy observations beneath oceans. And, and this kind of approach actually works, I think, quite nicely for testing um, ideas about, you know, what's driving the plates and how important is density-driven flow versus plate motion and how much net rotation of the lithosphere do we have. So I think anisotropy is really a very nice um, tool for thinking about these kinds of questions. Um, I also wanted to talk, because it came up in the discussion earlier this week, um, and several people asked me about it afterwards, um, we, we talked a little bit about getting at the sense of shear at the base of plates um, using seismic anisotropy. So, you know, really the question here, so, you know, the two end member models, you have a plate that, you know, is attached to a slab somewhere, and so it's being, you know, driven sort of from the side by slab pull over here, versus a plate where you have significant basal tractions and it's really being pushed along by active um, mantle flow. So this idea has, you know, kind of been out there for a while, that one, one way you might be able to get at that is by looking at deformation, you know, in this version of this cartoon, it's in the deep part of the lithosphere. I think you could also think about this, you know, in terms of the shallow part of the asthenosphere where you're maybe more likely to get more deformation. But the idea is that in, in this scenario versus this scenario, the sense of shear is different, right? So here you're, you know, you're pushing here and this stuff is just getting dragged along, whereas here you're actively pushing here. So you have, you know, a different sense of shear, one or the other. And so a prediction might be that you might actually have um, a, an anisotropy symmetry axis that dips uh, to this side for this cartoon and to this side for this cartoon. Um, now, this idea has kind of been out there for a while that you could test whether or not you have significant basal tractions pushing the plates along using anisotropy. And the hitch is that this is very hard to do. So someone has already alluded to the fact that um, observationally getting at the dip of the symmetry axis is really quite tricky. And really, you know, if you're looking at vertically propagating SKS waves, it's really very hard to do this. Um, this is one of the very few papers I could find that attempted to do this, um, work by Good Spokelman, and, and he was actually looking at um, P wave travel times. So again, there is some trade-off potentially with isotropic structure. But interestingly, so he did this for Cretonic North America for the Canadian Shield, and um, his conclusion was that you actually have this scenario, that you do have significant basal tractions um, there. So, you know, take that for what it's worth, but this is, you know, at least in theory is a very nice um, way to get at, you know, which plate driving uh, scenario you, you have. Bob? Well, this, is, this is a very important observation. Yes. Old, yes. So yes, we've had our scope since then. So, um, you know, and there's been an explosion of, you know, people looking at, at anisotropy beneath the North American continent. So I'm not sure who or whether anyone has kind of published anything specifically on this, but it's going to be out there. Yeah, yeah, and it would be great to do this in other plates as well. I mean, you know, if, to see if this conclusion for North America holds up and then to see can we do this in other places. Yep. <laughs> All right. Everybody hear that? <laughs> Duly noted. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So, so the a point was made that, and that is, it's an excellent point that I, you know, glossed over in the simple description of this. Um, this sort of works, uh, you know, sort of heuristically very well if you know exactly the fabric type, right? And for, you know, Greg talked about how, you know, the, the sense of rotation of your fast, um, your fast direction into the shear plane is opposite for A-type versus E-type fabric. And that is a big potential complication. So, um, you know, say again? Yes. Yeah, which way the fabric is dipping. Absolutely, absolutely. And I mean, another question I have, you know, this, this particular cartoon kind of puts this all in the, the lower part of the lithosphere, right? It's saying, okay, how is the lower part of the lithosphere deforming? You know, I mean, the lithosphere is, is stiff. Maybe it's not deforming very much, um, you know. But I, so, I mean, I think another way you could kind of get at this is, is to look at the asthenosphere, where, of course, you know, your, your strains are going to be much higher you know, then maybe it might be harder to catch this dip. You know, of course, with progressive finite strain, 
your finite strain ellipse is going to rotate into the shear plane. But so there are, you know, there are a lot of ways you could think about this, and there are, you know, a bunch of observables. Um, you know, Bokeman did this with P-wave travel time residuals, which you know has a bunch of assumptions built in. You know, there may be other ways to, to do it, but I agree that this is, you know, quite an important problem. Okay, I have about 25 more minutes, so. Um, I'd like to say a few words about anisotropy and subduction systems. So I know the, that continents are the focus of this meeting, but we've, um, we've talked a lot about subduction zones in the past couple of weeks because, of course, we think that you know, arc systems are the, the locus of formation of continental crust. And um, you know, we've seen quite a few cartoons like this. So this is one that Raj showed in his talk um, last week from, from Poli and Schmidt. You know, kind of a cartoon view of some of the processes um, operating in the mantle wedge, and this kind of um, encapsulates some very simple, you know, it's, well, relatively simple ideas. You know, you have the the slab that goes down, um, and in terms of of mantle flow patterns, so you have you know kind of two dimensional corner flow. Here you have viscous coupling between the slab and the overlying mantle, and that induces a two D two D corner flow in the mantle wedge. So you're sort of bringing in new material to be melted beneath your arc. Um, and then, you know, this cartoon is focused on the wedge, but of course you can imagine beneath the slab sort of a similar story. So, you know, maybe you have a 100 kilometer thick slab and beneath the slab you have viscous coupling between the slab and the subslab mantle. And so you have two dimensional entrained flow beneath the slab. And this is kind of our, you know, classical picture of how mantle flow um, works in a subduction zone. And I mean, I remember when Raj had this slide up, you know, we, we got a bunch of questions. Oh, well, but this cartoon doesn't, you know, it doesn't account for this and it doesn't encapsulate this. And, you know, that's not so much to pick on this particular cartoon, but just to say that, you know, a, a two-dimensional sketch doesn't fully encapsulate all our ideas about mantle processes. But if I were to make a critique of this 2D cartoon, um, you know, this, this is a very simple two-dimensional um, flow field. And, a question that I have been thinking quite a lot about um, over the last you know, 10 years or so is how well do our observations of anisotropy and subduction zones conform to this very simple you know, two-dimensional corner flow in the mantle wedge and two-dimensional entrained flow in the subslab mantle. Now, I could talk about subduction zone anisotropy for five hours. I have a feeling Cinti is not going to let me do that, and I know we all want to get to lunch. So this is the very quick um, version. If anyone is interested in this problem, come, come find me, because there's a lot of really interesting um, things here. So quickly, just to show um, a selection of observations of anisotropy in the mantle wedge. So these are um, all shear wave splitting studies that use shear waves originating from slab earthquakes, really only sample um, the mantle wedge. And so this is, this is Kamchatka, the Marianas, um, Central America, and, and Japan. And I'm not going to talk through the details of all this, but I hope that your takeaway looking at this collection of observations is that shear wave splitting in the mantle wedge is hideously complicated, very complex. We see lots of transitions in fast direction. We see huge variations in delay times. And, um, but I think the bottom line is that what we don't see is a beautiful, simple pattern that might be consistent with you know, two-dimensional corner flow and A-type olivine fabric. So we sort of know that there has to be you know, more complications um, going on. And there have actually been, um, depending on how you count, I think about a dozen different models that have been sort of proposed to explain this variability in mantle wedge um, anisotropy patterns. And this is just a you know, very simplified cartoon of shear wave splitting patterns in mantle wedges worldwide from a, a recent um, study that I did with Aaron Worth, one of my students. Um, there are a bunch of processes that likely do contribute to anisotropy in the mantle wedge, corner flow, um, a component of flow along strike, flow around the edge, B-type fabric, you might have a contribution from serpentinite, um, from hydrous minerals, which have very strong anisotropy. Um, the complicated slab morphology is going to affect things. You might have lower crustal foundering. There's just a, a whole um, range of processes. And one of the main conclusions, so, so this, in this study, we tried to kind of compile shear wave splitting measurements from wedges um, worldwide and kind of test some of these models. And we, we sort of came to the conclusion that none of these models really explains the global data set very well. Um, and a lot of these processes likely contribute. But what I want to leave you with 
is that I think it's very difficult to explain this global Mantle wedge anisotropy data set without appealing to some component of a long strike, some significant component of a long strike flow in a lot of subduction systems. So this is, of course, important if you think about you know, things like how the mantle is going to melt. Um, and so you know, we don't yet know what it is, but I, I think, in my opinion, it's, we can say with confidence that it's not simple 2D corner flow everywhere. And I think that's an important um, observation. Yes? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask you, because I've seen from the previous slide, yes. you can see the earthquakes that have been along the slide, and I've seen direct phases. How do you map the anisotropy from the direct phase in such a complex system? Yes, that's a great question. So you're, you're saying, so we're using um, these direct S phases that are kind of sampling this whole mantle wedge. I mean, there's. There's a bunch of ways you can do it. I mean, all of, I think all of these maps were made by just um, you know, plotting the, the, um, each individual shear wave splitting measurement kind of at the, the midpoint, so the, the map projection of the midpoint of the ray. But you know, we know that the mantle wedge is a very heterogeneous place. And most of these measurements are probably sampling sort of multiple regions of anisotropy. So that mapping is, is very difficult. Um, a few studies, and in particular the, the work by David Apt and Karin Fisher, Karin Fisher and others in Central America have, have um, you know, started to do tomography, shear wave splitting tomography with these, um, these types of measurements. If you have a very dense data set, um, you can do it. And so that you know, starts to help you figure out where and what parts of the system the anisotropy is. But it's quite complicated, um, you know, I mean, as, as you can see, I guess. So, good question. Yes, Richard. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah. um, only because we don't have terrific constraints on the wedge. So this is only the wedge part of the signal. And you know, Cascadia only has seismicity you know, max 80 kilometers. And in a lot of places, it's, it's um, less. You know, it's even shallower. So in Cascadia, you know, we have all these great SKS measurements. And it's, it's harder there than it is in most places to say what's in the wedge what's beneath the slab, what's potentially in the slab. So that makes, the lack of seismicity makes Cascadia tough. So, yes, Erica. Uh, yes. Yes, so I don't have a great slide in here, um, but you can compare that to SKS. And one of the useful uh, things that I think has come out of that comparison is that very often SKS is telling us something extremely different from local S, which I think is oftentimes implying that there's a contribution to SKS splitting from anisotropy beneath the wedge. So either in the subducting slab or in the subslab mantle. And so teasing apart the contribution, I mean, subduction zones, of course, are extremely complicated beasts, right? You have the overriding plate, you have the wedge, you have the, the slab, you have you know, dehydration here, you have melting, um, you have the subslab mantle, everything, you know, and the, everything is 3D, not 2D like in the cartoons. And depending on what type of phase you're looking at, you're sampling you know, mo many or all of those regions. So it's very important to tease apart, you know, for example, with an SKS phase, you know, what part of that signal is from anisotropy in the wedge, what part is from the subslab mantle, what part is from the slab. And so these are all good questions that don't always have easy answers, um, especially when you're limited by the lack of seismicity, say, in, in some places. Yes? Yes. Yes. So the question is about water content in subduction zones, and you know, do we sort of see systematic differences in subduction zone anisotropy with water content? Um, I mean, we've looked at, you know, we haven't yet directly looked at sort of comparing these estimates with estimates of water content, you know, from from melts or from you know any of the sort of indirect. Um, proxies that you might have for, for water content. You know, age of the slab might be one if that's affecting how the slab gets hydrated. Um, but I, so I, I don't think we have a great answer for how that affects, but I, I think it's likely to be very important. And, and one reason that it's likely to be important is, um, I mentioned this briefly, that um, particularly in the shallow part of the system here, so hydrous minerals such as um, antigorite and talc and lizardite and all those 
um, fun phases, they have extremely high shear wave anisotropies. So Antigrate has something like 80% um, shear wave anisotropy. So they have, even though you know, they might be fairly localized to small um, parts of the system, but they have a very strong effect on the anisotropy. So I think it might be sort of exciting if we can start thinking how can we use you know, observations of anisotropy, especially if we can get at, you know, sort of specific layers or regions of the subduction system that have this a signal from hygis phases to start to tell us something about the water distribution. So that's a cutting edge research question, but I, I don't think we're quite there yet. So, but yes? Say, I, mean, I mean, this strikes me as quite a good thing to do for the next two weeks. Is, you know, okay, the yes. That would be wonderful. That, yes. Does anyone want to do this? Yes. Because that's something that, <laughs> okay, <laughs> sold. <laughs> um, that's something that we didn't include in our compilation. And, I mean, mostly just because I didn't quite have the expertise to do it. So, yes. The different, so the colors are um, basically just color coded by the pattern. I know this, this cartoon is a little bit of a mess. It's an attempt to represent these extremely complicated data sets in a cartoon. So red, red means um, here, so you have a, generally a transition from trench parallel fast splitting directions to in the sort of fore arc um, to trench uh, perpendicular as you go into the back arc. So the pink ones are mo dominated by trench parallel fast directions and then yellow and green are sort of you know, different um, patterns. And you, know, you can also see that there's a really huge variation in um, delay times. And we, um, in this study, we tried to normalize those by path lengths. And th so there's you know, is still a lot of variation even when you normalize by path lengths. So you know, we have this compilation of wedge splitting parameters, and I would love to compare it to any sort of geochemical or petrological or other proxies that might be telling us about um, sort of subduction processes, because we really focused on sort of the geophysical part of the story, geophysical observables. So yes, that would be wonderful. Yeah, we've, I mean, a little bit, uh, and, and I've, I've talked to Raj a little bit about it, and we keep saying this would be cool to do, and we just haven't done it yet, so. Yes, please. Sold. <laughs> okay, how am I doing for time? All right. Um, I'm going to skip the sub-slab mantle because um, it's just sort of not our focus, other than that to say that there, um, again, the anisotropy observations do not look anything like what we would expect for a two-dimensional uh, entrained flow and, and simple A-type or similar olivine fabric, and that figuring out why this is um, occupies a lot of my time these days. Um, so the bottom line is just that anisotropy and subduction systems usually uh, does not conform to these simple model predictions, and I think that understanding why this is um, will tell us a lot about how subduction zones work. And if anyone is um, interested in this whole subduction zone problem, um, I just wrote a very long and involved <laughs> detailed review paper on this that um, you might find interesting. And I'm also delighted to talk anybody's ear off about this problem at any time. Okay, so I have about 12 minutes left before lunch, and I do, because the focus of this meeting is um, continental assembly and destruction, I do want to talk about um, anisotropy beneath continents. And um, we've already seen and talked through um, some aspects of this cartoon, but I'll just reiterate that a very important part of this story is figuring out you know, what part of the anisotropy signature or signal is in the, the lithosphere and represents frozen in past deformation and what part is in the asthenosphere and is telling us about active um, processes. So um, I thought I'd start with kind of a, just a tale of two continents and we've actually you know, I, I already showed a version of, um, of Australia anisotropy, and we're going to talk a lot more about North America in just a minute. Um, this is sort of a pre, more or less pre-Earthscope, um, for the most part, pre-Earthscope view of North America. So um, this is changing rapidly, and we're going to look at um, some of the Yuan and Romanowitz work in just a second. Um, but this is just a, you know, to compare and contrast. So on, on top, these are shear waves SKS uh, splitting maps for Australia and North America, and then we have a you know, cross-section um, through each of these here. So this is a you know, isotropic tomography model, and then a model for um, radial anisotropy and um, just the strength of azimuthal anisotropy. Information about the fast direction isn't on this particular plot. Um, but what I hope you can see, and you know, again, we've already touched on this, is that there's quite a lot of variation. I mean, Australia has you know, very variable 
fast um, splitting directions and delay times um, as well. And if we look at you know, the radial and, and certainly the azimuthal anisotropy strength, you know, there's a lot of structure here. So the anisotropy um, strength and also the orientation, I know it's not on this plot, it, it's varying quite a bit with, um, with depth within um, the lithosphere and you know, maybe th there's a, it looks as though there's you know, quite a contrast between what's going on in the lithosphere and then in the asthenospheric upper mantle. And we see very complicated and um, sort of rich uh, shear wave splitting patterns. And of course, we would love to be able to um, you know, sort of convert these seismological observations into insights about mantle dynamics and questions about you know, continental um, formation and accretion and all that great stuff. So just to specifically talk about North America, I mean, we've already seen um, a bit at this meeting how EarthScope is kind of revolutionizing our view of the North American continent. And um, folks who work on anisotropy have been very busy um, making observations. So over here on the right, this is um, just a, a section of a compilation or, or a, a large um, study of SKS splitting. So this is by Rafei et al. Um, this is here, we're looking at kind of Texas, Oklahoma, so South Central United States. Um, and then this is a model by Lynn and others um, that's mostly based on surface wave constraints. I think they might have some constraints from SKS in here as well. So this is um, azimuthal anisotropy in the uppermost mantle. And, you know, just the, the scale over which we're getting information about the detailed um, anisotropic structure is just, you know, vastly improved by um, our, our use of Earthscope data. So I, I think it's a very exciting time to be thinking about um, the anisotropy of the North American continent um, in particular. Um, I want to show a couple of figures. So this is from, from the Berkeley model. So this is work by Yuan and Romanowitz and others. Um, and they've you know, been constructing a you know, kind of continent, sort of synoptic continent-wide um, you know, continent scale view of, of anisotropy, um, incorporating constraints from both SKS and um, surface waves. And this, you know, this paper is now a couple of years old, so it's sort of mostly the, the densest data coverage is over here in the western um, part of the continent, and of course this is improving all the time. Um, but what's really nice is that you know, now we're getting a very nice continent scale view of things that is, you know, really very well resolved in the western U.S. and is only going to get better as you go east with the addition of more and more Earthscope data. Um, and it's kind of a, you know, a s similar sort of heuristic story as we saw in Australia where if you kind of look at lithospheric um, depths, there's quite a bit of variability in both the geometry and strength of anisotropy. You know, and then you, we get down to, you know, maybe asthenospheric depths and um, the scale over which we see rapid changes is, is different. Um, and a really nice way of sort of visualizing these models, this is um, from a Nature paper published by Yuan and Romanowitz a few years ago, um, is that, you know, I... I think what's really exciting about this is now we can start asking the kinds of questions about, okay, well, you know, how does the lithospheric anisotropy change with depth and laterally, and how does that relate to the, you know, geological architecture that we see at the surface? So this is, you know, kind of a version of the United Plates of America map that we've, we've seen, um, and these are some cross sections. So I think this top one is uh, this one, and then the, the bottom one is, is this one, um, through the anisotropy model. And so the colors here are representing um, basically the direction of the fast axis. So this is the azimuthal anisotropy part of the model. Um, and this thick dashed line is, um, you know, sort of corresponding to the um, base of the lithosphere, so the LAB. And what's really neat is that there is, you know, a very distinct contrast in anisotropic geometry, you know, both as you go across the lithosphere, asthenosphere boundary, but also here in the, in the middle of the lithosphere. It looks like there's, you know, two very distinctive domains, you know, between sort of the upper part of the lithosphere and the lower part of the lithosphere. And, you know, it, I mean, this is a surface wave model, but, um, you know, it, it looks as though this, um, this contrast could be very sharp. And I think a very provocative question is, you know, does this correspond to the mid-lithospheric discontinuity? And, you know, this question came up in the discussion that, um, that the students had last night. You know, what is the MLD? Is this represent a contrast in anisotropic um, properties? So, you know, again, uh, um, you know, as, as Earthscope continues to move east, I mean, we're just going to, we're going to get better and better resolution, both with the um, transportable array and also with various um, flexible array um, experiments here in the central and eastern part of the continent. So I think as the 
kind of attention of Earth scope shifts a little bit from tectonically active um, Western North America to Central and Eastern North America, I think we have a real opportunity to think you know, quite a bit about what these lithospheric anisotropy variations mean and what they're, you know, really what they're telling us about um, past deformation processes. Um, I just have a couple of minutes left. I just want to, I want to show one more observation of anisotropy from um, the eastern U.S. And this is um, based, this is work by uh, Laura Wagner, who's here, um, and I was involved in making some of these measurements. And, you know, as, as I said, you know, the station coverage in the eastern U.S. is, is not, um, not great. So we were looking at um, permanent and then a few temporary uh, stations in the eastern U.S., and the southeastern part of the United States in particular has a, a very, I think, kind of weird shear wave splitting pattern. Um, many of the stations located out here kind of on the, on the coastal plain actually don't show very strong splitting. We measure, you know, 100 SKS phases at a lot of these stations with very good back azimuthal coverage, and we don't see any splitting at all, which is kind of a, a, um, an odd observation. Um, but what Laura did is we made a bunch of new measurements and compiled measurements from a bunch of studies and sort of, um, you know, looked and said here in the southeastern U.S., you know, we have a region that's dominated by nulls, and then we have these stations that are dominated by quite strong splitting, and a few, even out here in the null region, you know, some, some um, fast directions. And what, what Laura did is went and kind of compared this map to a bunch of, you know, sort of geological indicators, so you know, geology and gravity, and um, this is the, the magnetic anomaly. And what you can see, so this is the uh, New York-Alabama magnetic lineament, um, this is the Brunswick magnetic anomaly, and the Carolina magnetic lineament, and all of these are thought to correspond to, you know, suture zones, where we have, um, you know, sort of terrain accretion onto the side of North America. So these may have been, you know, very concentrated zones of deformation as you were, you know, bringing these different terrains together in the geologic past. And interestingly, um, right along these inferred suture zones, we very often see strong SKS splitting kind of parallel to the lineament. So, I mean, I, this is, you know, I, I think it's fair to say quite preliminary based on just, you know, a fairly small number of stations, but I think it's kind of a provocative hypothesis to ask, you know, as we get more and more earth scope data um, in this region, is are we seeing sort of a very localized anisotropy signature from, that corresponds to some of these ancient um, suturing events that you know, might be telling us very directly about some, some of these past uh, deformation episodes. So I'm going to wrap up there. Um, I thought I would end just with a list of what I think are um, major and important unsolved problems related to studying anisotropy in continents. So um, are there multiple layers of anisotropy in the lithosphere you know, throughout all continental regions? We, we seem to see this in North America. Is this a general feature of continents? Um, how well do patterns, these patterns of lithospheric anisotropy correspond to um, individual geologic or tectonic provinces? I think this is a question we're in the process of being able to answer for North America using Earthscope. Um, can we get to the point where we're really interpreting lithospheric anisotropy in terms of past uh, mantle deformation processes? Does this mid-lithosphere discontinuity correspond to a contrast in anisotropy? And this was a question that was already articulated by one of the groups last night. Um, does the continental LAB, lithosphere asthenosphere boundary, does that correspond to a contrast in anisotropic properties? And what is that telling us? Um, and then, you know, kind of coming back to this basal traction a mantle flow at the base of continent problem. Um, you know, what controls anisotropy in the subcontinental asthenosphere? Is, it, is this always absolute plate motion parallel, or, or are there other factors? So a long list of, I think, exciting questions that we're sort of poised to start um, addressing rigorously. So I'll stop there. We can eat, or we can have questions <laughs> before that. <laughs> Bob. Oh, yeah, that's a great question that I don't know the answer to. Are they, are they one and the same, or are they two different things? Barbara, do you want to weigh in on that? I, I, well, I think the difference between these two was defined as an anisotropic. I thought it was an impedance change. Yeah, I mean, the hill is covered in impedance, maybe you just couldn't Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so the, qu the question I'll repeat it just for the video is about the Hales discontinuity and where, whether that um, is one and the same with what we're calling the mid lithosphere discontinuity. Um, Right. Uh, which is not completely clear that it's the same thing. Oh, right. Sorry. <laughs> Should I repeat? Or? Uh, okay. Okay. Yes, that's so, right. So the, so the point Kate's making up here is that the, you know, the character of the Hales discontinuity, it, it's not clear that it's the same everywhere. And it's not clear that, that you know, what we're now seeing, um, certainly beneath North America, with this mid lithosphere discontinuity is, is the one and the same. So. There's also the, what's called the 8 degree discontinuity, which mm -hmm. is seen in long range profiles mm -hmm, mm -hmm. quite systematically at about 100 kilometers mm -hmm, in many, mm -hmm. many continental regions. And so the question is, is this all the same? Is this all the same thing? Thing? And what is it? <laughs> The orientation of uh, olivine and uh, other minerals, for example, pyroxenes. Yes. Do they have the same effect on the anisotopy or do they have a contrast effect? Uh? Yeah, that's a great question that I think we only partially know the answer to. So the question is about the effect of, you know, of course, mantle is not made only of olivine. Um, there's pyroxene and other minerals in it as well. You know, basically all of the lab experiments on um, lattice preferred orientation. It, and mantle anisotropy are done on pure olivine aggregates, which of course is not right, is not um, representative. So there, I mean, there have been some studies of, of um, natural rocks that have looked at the, you know, the orientation of, of pyroxene and, and olivine separately. You know, pyroxene has much weaker intrinsic anisotropy, so it, it can modify the fabric. I, I don't think that there's any evidence that it you know, completely changes the argument. But certainly it's, it's an effect. And I, you know, I think it, I would feel a little better about um, using those deformation experiments um, to interpret our seismology if we had some experimental handle on how LPO um, works in a two-phase aggregate rather than in a pure olivine um, aggregate. So it's a, a great question. I don't, Greg, if you want to expand on that. Um, yes, there are a fair number of Yeah, of, of natural rocks. Yeah. Natural rocks, which yeah. demonstrate the effect of pyroxene. Yeah. Um, and then there, those data are consistent with lab work on pyroxenes right. that show how the dominant slip systems in pyroxene mm -hmm. um, change with mm -hmm. temperature. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, Nick. There's a lot of information that you can get about crustal structure from and I saw yes. in the crust, and yes. uh, there's been a lot of work with active source studies and yes. uh, potentially with some of the new ambient noise stuff that you could yes. actually get a lot of information about. You know, people always talk about these um, ultramafic bodies in the lower crust and things like that, which, you know, maybe they have some sort of layering in them that might show up yes, as that radial is, anisotropy. That is an excellent, so something to think about. excellent point. And certainly in terms of thinking about continental processes, you know, deformation in the lower crust is extremely important. And you know, my focus on mantle anisotropy really is a reflection of my own interest in biases and not the relative importance of you know, crustal versus mantle anisotropy. I think one challenge in thinking about, you know, certainly, um, as Nick says, that there are, you know, especially with ambient noise techniques, we're starting to get you know, quite a lot of observations of anisotropy, particularly in the lower crust. You know, one challenge there is I think that we don't have as good a handle on things like slip systems and what are the important minerals for lower crustal materials as, as we do for olivine. And maybe that you know, just reflects my own knowledge of the literature. But I know that there are, you know, that's a very active area of research sort of on the mineral and rock physics side is figuring out. Yep, and sh exactly, and so shape preferred you know, orientation. Yeah, layered, layered structures, and yep, absolutely. So this is a very, I think, very rich area of, of inquiry. Yeah, Greg. yeah so, so Maureen, I remember Paul Silver always harping on <laughs> shear wave splitting parallel to tectonic boundaries. Yeah. And it was like something he said, this is always happening. And, yeah. And you kind of... Your analysis of the eastern U.S. That you, with Laura seemed to support that. Yes, Paul he, is smiling had, down on this. <laughs> yeah, but what was his explanation for that, other yeah. than that he always showed it? Right, so, so um, 
Paul Silver, in his thinking about, I mean, he, of course, did a lot of thinking about anisotropy in continental regions, and, and you know, he, the model that he sort of put forward is this idea of vertically coherent deformation, so we would have, you know, um, say, an orogeny or orogenic event that is going to, you know, sort of deform the entire lithosphere coherently and it will end up giving you a fabric such that you have fast directions, you know, parallel to, say, mountain belts. And so, um, yeah, you know, I mean, it, it cer certainly applies to sort of the frozen lithospheric part of the signal. And I, yeah, I mean, I think it will be interesting to see in the eastern U.S., where we have a lot of kind of test cases to think about this, whether that is borne out. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely a potential end member. You know, there are other ways of, you know, or other end, kind of end member models for lithospheric deformation that don't agree with that view. But Barbara definitely wants to say something. <laughs> yes. Since you showed this model that we, we yes, uh, developed yes. in North America, in fact, there's been a long controversy between Paul Silver and others like uh, Lev Vinnik, when one would say most of the SKS splitting comes from the mantle, and the other yeah. would say no, it mostly comes from the frozen in uh, anisotropy in the lithosphere. In fact, this study that we did shows kind of reconciles yeah. these, yeah. because in the top of the lithosphere, in North America at least, you see um, frozen in, obviously frozen in anisotropy that, that follows the sutures actually quite well. And it so happens that it, these are quasi-parallel to the absolute plate motion, which you actually see you know, two layers below. So I think there is really a combination of things. It's, it's not one model versus the other, but it's really, a, you know, you have both contributing. Yep. This, this is um, testable because we have mantle xenoliths, which are lithospheric samples, mm -hmm. and so what people can do is measure the fabric and compare, you know, basically calculate, can that explain the anisotropy? It's, it's, a, yep. it's, a, it, it's an intersection between petrology yep. and yep. geophysics. That's absolutely right, and I mean, I think it's particularly exciting, you know, there are places in the world where we have, you know, mantle xenoliths, and it's quite you know, exciting to think about collecting seismic data there and really doing, you know, for that particular region, you know, doing a very good job of interpreting both the, the petrology and the, um, you know, petrographic analysis of the, of the xenolith samples and also the seismology in concert. So I think that's an excellent point. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we know that now uh, receiver functions, for example, also can better also identify yes. at least this uh, variation along the uh, direction, azimuthal variation, yes. uh, due to the anisotropy. However, I couldn't really understand, but as far as I know from other papers also, to be able to model using some kind of inversion scheme is not so easy due to the non-uniqueness of the problem. Yes. Then now, we also see, you also shown that from Romanovich and et al., then people can use also surface waves and SKS splitting. Yes. So this can already provide some good constraints to start with doing inversion for the receiver function analysis. Yes. Maybe. Yes. Is there I any way to agree. use? Or has anyone used this? <laughs> yes. Tree? My one of my students actually has okay. just started um, looking at anisotropic receiver functions for Earth scope stations, or um, starting, I guess, with sort of long-running stations in North America to try to see if we can directly get a handle from receiver functions on whether, you know, do we see this sharp contrast in anisotropy across the MLD or whatever you, you'd like to call it, and can we see that in receiver functions? And so that's, um, you know, I mean, I'm sure we're not the only people working on this, but it's, a, it's an excellent idea, and, um, you know, we, from the first few stations that uh, Aaron has looked at, you know, we do see transverse component energy associated with this, um, discontinuity. So um, we will stay tuned. We will be working on this. Um, and you're absolutely right. The forward modeling of these anisotropic receiver functions is very non-unique. There is a ton of parameters that go into that. And so, you know, doing this in a place where there is a very good, you know, background model of, for the anisotropy, you know, based on surface waves and SKS will absolutely provide a very good starting point for the modeling. So we are hoping to be able to, to do this. Yes, Wang Ping, yeah. Oh, yeah, the mic, yeah. 
just sort of uh, throw another monkey wrench into the discussion because it has puzzled me for a long time. You showed briefly that there are a lot of uh, no splittings yes. in the eastern U.S. And sometimes, you know, very large splitting and no splitting happen almost next to each other, which suggests yeah. a very shallow source for the anisotropy, yet the amount of anisotropy is very large. Have, have you any uh, thoughts on that? This has puzzled me for a long time, too. Yes, no, it's, a, it's an excellent point. Um, so both in terms of you know, null measurements and non-null measurements, so that are adjacent, sometimes in terms of back azimuth and sometimes in terms of you know, laterally adjacent stations. But also, I mean, I think there's an even larger point just about the, the length scale of heterogeneity that we often see in SKS splitting does not always jibe with what we think about the depth distribution of anisotropy, right? So if you have, you know, and actually the Eastern U.S. data set is a, a really great example that keeps me awake at night where, you know, we see it, this, it's a little hard to see on, on here, but the dots are kind of pierce points of null measurements, and then, of course, the, the splits are here. It's probably, it's hard to see the, the details of this, but, you know, so this is um, the station in Blacksburg, and you have really nice nulls over a pretty large range, and then you see really nice splits, a bunch of really nice splits at, at some range, um, you know, some azimuthal range. I, I suspect that it's a combination, that some of this is that we are seeing, you know, just very small scale variations in the the lithospheric anisotropy, you know, that may be associated with these kinds of, of structures. Another possibility, and I think that we see this sometimes, is that it's not all in the upper mantle. And, and Barbara alluded to the, you know, sort of averaging over back azimuths to sort of eliminate any contribution from the lower mantle. But one way to explain, you know, when you have a station that has beautiful null measurements at every back azimuth and then, you know, one set of gorgeous splits, um, you know, I think a, a good interpretation for that might actually be that it's in the lower mantle, um, you know, maybe in, in D double prime. So I think that we have to, you know, I think that our serious splitting data sets have gotten good enough that we can really start trying to get at these variations that, you know, I mean, you can sort of just take a single station average and not worry about it too much, but I think these variations are probably telling us something, either about the scale of heterogeneity in the shallow lithosphere or maybe about deep mantle structures. So it's a great question that, you know, I don't think anybody has a great answer to, but I, I worry about it too. Okay. Uh, just a reminder, two, uh, Yaron Ekstrand and Wang Ping Chen are going to give some brief talks. And uh, with that, let's thank uh, Maureen again and go for lunch. <laughs>